We are in Matthew 15, verse 21. And Jesus went away from there. So the there is Israel. He went away from Israel and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, circle O Lord. And then underline, son of David. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter, is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word, circle word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep, circle lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, circle Lord again, help me. And he answered, underline the sentence, it is not right to give the children's bread, circle bread, and throw it to the dogs, circle dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, underline this phrase, yet even the dogs eat crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, oh woman, great, circle great, great is your faith, circle faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Wow. Wow. We are going to take a walk through a passage of scripture that I can almost guarantee you've never heard in your entire life in in the way that we're going to talk about it today. And I want to make something clear, ready? There's many times in all of our lives that God is silent. There's many times we pray about things and God says not a word. God doesn't respond. God, please don't let my grandma die. God, please don't let my son get sick. God, please help my marriage survive. God, please don't let me lose my job. And it just seems like silence from God. It seems like silence from the heavens, like the heavens are covered in glass and our prayers don't get through. I'm gonna talk about something today that literally will transform your life if you absorb it into how you live your life. So let's take a look. If you got your notes, pull them out. They're in the bulletin that was handed out to you, hopefully when you got here. If you didn't get any, that fine young man in the blue uh, polo right there will hand you notes. Just slip your hand up and go, hey, I need some notes. There's somebody hard over to your left there over there too. Um, Number one is this, ready? Number one in your notes, Jesus leaves for the lost. Jesus leaves for the lost. Let's walk through this passage because it might surprise you how this actually applies to our lives today. Jesus leaves for the lost. After spending the majority of his ministry within the borders of Israel to the Jews, because he's a Jew, Jesus goes north to the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon by the Mediterranean Sea. So everybody pay attention real quick. I'm going to lay out some geography, even though we're under tents, and you're going to have to use your eagle eyes to see me, because I don't know if you can see the screen. But watch this. Israel is like the sh- kind of the shape of your hand. It's, like a, sh- it's a shoe-shaped landmass country. Watch. Over here is the Mediterranean Sea. So if you've ever gone on a Mediterranean cruise, that's this ocean over here, the sea. Watch. Israel has land on this side, which they're usually fighting with somebody about over here. And the Mediterranean here. North of that, watch, is Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are two port cities on the Mediterranean Sea. They're outside of Israel. They're in, they're in a, a Canaanite area. They're not Jewish, they're totally pagan, they're totally Gentile. So let me help you with some terminology if you're unfamiliar. There's basically two types, according to the Jews, the two types of people. There's Jews and there's everybody else. So there's Jews and Gentiles. So if you are not full-blooded Jew, so I'm, I'm 100, nearly 100% Norwegian, I am nearly, I am 100% Gentile. So there's Jews and then there's me and probably everybody else here. Unless you're 100% Jew, you're a Gentile with me. So there's Jews and Gentiles. So watch, if you're not a Jew in Israel 2,000 years ago, living there, you are either a Jew living somewhere else doing business, but still connected to your homeland, Israel, or you are a Gentile, which covers the whole rest of the world. The Norwegians, the Italians, the Australians, everybody else in the whole wide world are, are Gentiles. Watch what happens. There's, there's, there's prejudice between the Jews and 
how they view everybody else. So now watch, the greatest Jew of all time, Jesus, the goat, which is what we're talking about here in this, in this series, the greatest of all time. He's the greatest man who ever lived because he's God in the flesh. That guy is gonna leave Israel and go, and go north. Hang on as I pause. He's gonna go north to a place called the region of Tyre and Sidon. There are port cities, ships from all over the world port there and then offload all their stuff. So it's high Gentile, high cultic. It's a wealthy area. And that's where Jesus has gone. He's basically going on vacation. Anybody need a vacation? Praise God, right? You're like, where should I go? You know, Maui, Australia, Hemet, you know, where any of the beautiful places. So when you're, when you're like stressed out and you're like, dude, I got it. I got to take a vacation. You think about places like where can I take my family? Or if I don't want to go with my family, where can I leave my family and go on vacation? So that's what Jesus is doing at this time in his ministry. He's bailing out of Israel to go north to a Gentile area, basically taking his boys, taking his disciples kind of on a vacation to go and do ministry. But kind of get away from the chaos that's happening in his life in Israel. So that's the context here. After spending the majority of his ministry within the border of Israel to the Jews, Jesus goes to the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon by the Mediterranean Sea. These two cities were wealthy coastal shipping ports. They were heavily influenced by sailors and merchants who brought with them their sinful lifestyles and cultic practices from all over the world. So if you've ever been in the Navy, I got any Navy peeps here? Any seals keeping me safe? Okay, don't say anything, all right? So down in San Diego, we have ports there. We have ports of call. We have uh, one of the biggest shipping areas between San Diego and Long Beach in the world as far as like stuff that's shipped into the United States at our port. So we got the Navy uh, down in San Diego plus a bunch of huge shipping ports. Well, guess what? When people come docking in there, if you're in the Navy or you get to travel all around the world, one of the benefits of being in the military, you get to go all around the world and dock at different ports. You're like, hey, we're, I'm like a tourist, except you're kind of not. And so the, the, the Navy will send you all around the world. Well, guess what? Once you get off the ship, you've been on a ship with a hundred other smelly guys and you get off that ship and you're like ready to party. And so you get off and you go to a bar, or you go to wherever, and you just want to get out and do some R&R. Well, that's what happens at Tyre and Sidon. It's wealthy. A lot of uh, merchants come in there, but also a lot of guys, they bring their sinful lifestyles with them. Prostitution is rampant in these cities. Um, you know, gambling and everything else that comes with guys that, young men that have too much money and are bored. And so that's what Tyre and Sidon is. So you have Jesus, God in the flesh, traveling around basically to the Las Vegases of his day where everybody goes to party, where everybody goes to do drugs, where everybody goes for prostitution, where everybody goes to like hang out and like, I'm gonna go on vacation and just go, go chill up here. That's, t that's the, the tire in Sidon that Jesus is, is going towards. So I wanna give you that, that foundation. A woman who lives in that area is gonna run into Jesus. Here's the principle, ready? Here's our first principle. The darker the time, the greater the light shines. The darker the time of a culture, the greater the light shines. So listen to me. In our culture right now, we are going through one of the darkest spiritual times that I think the majority of us who are alive have, have ever seen. So my grandmother's 99 years old, and I don't know if I'm ever gonna get to see her again while she's on this side of Jesus uh, being alive because of COVID and everything else. I don't know if I'll get to travel to see her. But I mean, she's, all, she's almost 100 years old. So she was born in 1920, practically they were still pulling, you know, cars had horse, real horses pulling them around town. And so she, imagine what she's seen from like pre-car to we're sending up guys on basically planes to catch the, the uh, space station. But you know, one of the things with her is that she was basically saying, these are, these are the darkest times that she can remember. And she went through to the depression. She went through the craziest times financially that the United States has ever seen. But as far as spiritually goes, the chaos and the anxiety and the lostness that everybody feels. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna lay something out for you that might surprise you. God allows lostness, God allows lostness 
in your own life and in a society to help people find the way to be found. So watch, in the darkest times, the light needs to shine the brightest. In our culture right now, we're in dark times. We're in dark spiritual times. We're in a lot of lostness. And this is the time when the church has to shine. This is the time when Jesus has to shine through you. Everybody pay attention to me. Listen to me. If you're already thinking about lunch, shame on you. Pay attention. Ready? Watch this. Being with Jesus is a lot like a light source. It's a lot like a power source. When you're plugged into it, when you're connected to it, you have power in your life. You have light in your life. When you disconnect and go chase something else, whether it's popularity or, or money or whatever it is, when you disconnect from God and go somewhere else, you, you lose the light. You lose the reason that God left you in this world, that Jesus is the light of the world. You and I aren't the light of the world, but when we are connected to the light of the world, we become ambassadors for the light. So in the darkest of our culture, in the chaos of our culture, in the anxiety of this moment, whether it's financial or social or whatever it is, people need to see Jesus. People need to see the light because in the darkness, the light shines bright. In the dark, you can see the light the greatest. The darker the moment, the greater that light is, the greater, the more obvious that light is. And for many of us as Christians, I'm just so saddened by Christians who, who start to care more about politics or social things or, or finances or they fight online or they, 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 they bully other people. Like if you don't share this thing, you don't believe in you know, people or love people or whatever. It's like, man, you don't, some of these things can be good things to, to, to care about, but you can't stop concentrating on the one thing that makes you a light in the world. Once you detach from the light and you go somewhere else, you're just as lost as everybody else. Like when you lose your saltiness, when you lose your light, when you disconnect and go run after other things, you, you literally are not being the reason you're built. You're built for darkness. You're built for the moment. You are built for this moment. This isn't a moment of lostness for Christians. This isn't a moment of like, I give up. I can't, I can't believe this is the worst time ever. It's not. This is the reason you're here, son. This, this is the reason Christians, Christians exist. If it wasn't so, listen to me, if it wasn't so, Jesus would just zap you to heaven and just go, let's start eternity up in heaven. Why does God leave us here? Because we are built to be the light. And if you're not being the light, you, you're, you're not serving your purpose. If you're running around with the chaos of our culture uh, and the lostness of our culture, what good are you doing other than adding to the, to, the, to the chaos of the moment? So Jesus right here is going to find some lost people even on his vacation. Anybody ever found lost people on their vacation? Jesus is going to find one right here. Look at this. While he's there in this region of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus meets a local woman with a demonically possessed daughter. So this woman has a daughter who uh, the demon inside of her is causing some physical issues or some health issues or whatever it is, is causing her to not be able to function correctly. And so though this Canaanite woman has many religious options, like the temple of Eshman, which is local to her, he was a local God of healing that they believed. Nothing she has done has worked. Everybody pay attention real quick. You can't see it on your screen because it's too, it's too bright out here, but you can Google Temple of Eshman. Don't do it now. You can Google Temple of Eshman. You will see the temple. Listen to me. They unearthed the temple about 10 years ago at the area of Tyre and Sidon. So when you go on a Mediterranean cruise sometime in your life and they dock at either Tyre or or Sidon, and you get to go off the port and you know walk around, you can literally go to this temple. The temple that this woman would have taken her daughter to to get healed is still existing. The throne, there's a throne there in the temple of Eshman that women like her would have taken their daughter and they would have laid their daughter on these, this, this, temp, this temple throne and she would have prayed to the God of Eshman to heal her daughter. That temple still exists. You can go visit it. So understand this woman in this story probably took her daughter multiple times to the temple of Eshman, laid her daughter on that throne and prayed to the God that doesn't exist to heal her daughter. And guess what? Because the God of Eshman doesn't exist, her daughter left the same from that temple as she was before she got there. So watch, she's done everything she can, everything her culture told her to do, she's done. She went to the temple of Eshman, she maybe burned some sage or uh, gave some money to it or whatever. She's trying to manipulate whatever gods the, the Canaanites worshiped to heal her daughter. 
None of that's worked. And here, let me tell you something. If you're giving answers to social problems or financial problems or cultural problems that aren't Jesus, you are leading people down the wrong path because there will never be, here's my thing, you'll never have enough money to have peace in your heart. You'll just never have enough money. You'll never have enough money to have peace in your heart because money can come and go. Those of us that have been in the stock market, you've seen the thing go up and down and all over the place and you lose like half of the stuff you, you, know, you, you tried to save up for the last 30 years, all of a sudden it's gone and you overnight and you realize, I thought I was kind of set for my retirement and now I got to go back to work or whatever. So understand, you'll never have enough money to go, now I can be at peace. You'll never have enough friends to go, now I don't feel lonely. You'll never have enough relationships to go, hey, now you know things are great in my life. There will never come a point where you will have stuff outside of knowing Jesus that makes your life worth living. Watch. Because when you, when you detach from God or you don't know God at all, like this woman does, she's trying to find answers in her culture. Her culture is telling her a bunch of stuff like, do this stuff for your daughter, fix this problem this way. It's not working because it's not the real God. And now that leads her to despair and depression and for many of us, we're in that space right now where we just go, I'm full of anxiety. I'm full of, I'm, I'm full of despair. Like I, 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 I feel some days like if tomorrow is the same as today, I don't want to live it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to live another day like this. So it leads us to, to hopelessness. It leads us to, to lo- we feel lost because money hasn't worked because relationships hasn't worked because sexual things haven't worked. And it, we, re- we realize literally nothing I have done, I've gone to the temple of Eshman, so to speak, in our culture. I've done everything our culture says, hey, do these things. Everything I've felt pressured to do from, from social media or my friends or whatever, and nothing works. Nothing gives me peace. Nothing gives me joy. I feel anxious and full of anxiety all the time. I feel lost. I feel dark inside. I just feel, I feel like if there is a God, I don't know him. And I love this story because this woman has done everything her culture said, hey, do this. She did it. It doesn't work. But now she's going to find the answer. And this is why Christians need to shine in the dark just the way Jesus does in this story. And here's the principle, ready? Lostness can propel people to seek a way out of being lost. You ever felt lost? Ever been physically lost? I remember I lost my son, who happens to be sitting over there in that chair. We lost him in, in uh, Ikea. Has anybody ever been to Ikea? <laughs> Full of glorious furniture. Now, when you get old and crusty like me, it's a fun adventure to go to a furniture store. Well, we took Caleb when he was about three years old. True story. We were standing in one of the aisles and watching all the furniture that's there. And I happened to look down after a couple of minutes and my son wasn't there. And so I said, oh, he must be with Julie, my wife. And uh, Julie, is Caleb with you? No, I thought he was with you. The famous, you know, par- parental conversation. I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. All of a sudden, you know what happens to parents? The sickest moment in a parent's life when you realize, where's my kid? And you start looking around, you're in Ikea. Could be anywhere. Could be hiding anywhere. Could be taken by anybody. So we start asking around, asking everybody. Nobody can find him. Well, Turns out Caleb had bailed and went, slept on a bed or something somewhere. And uh, we ended up finding him. But guess what? That lostness, the lostness of that moment is one of the sickest feelings you will ever feel. Whether you feel lost or you've lost somebody else. That lostness feeling, you never want to feel that. And when you start feeling that for a long time, you go, I think I want to die. Because lostness is just, it propels despair. It propels depression. And here's the thing. Jesus right now is going to step into this moment and the lostness she feels from her culture has propelled her to try to find an answer. And Jesus is that answer. Look at uh, Acts 17, 26 and 27. Acts 17, 26 and 27. You won't be able to see it on the screen, but I will read it for you. It's this. Uh, This is a famous sermon from 2000 years ago out of the, uh, the 17th chapter of Acts. And uh, it says this, and he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So watch this. The Bible records that God made the first man. We didn't evolve to be humans. We were made humans. And so God builds the first man and he builds the first woman. And these are our first parents. We literally come from, from one set of humans. 
which is why we, can, we are all the human race. We are of one race. Regardless of our skin color, we are all one race. We're all one family because we come from one set of, of parents. So he's going to say right here in this sermon, every nation in the world has traveled from two sets of, from this one set of parents and, and the one guy that was first made, who is Adam. So watch. Having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So God decides where all the nations live. Next, 27. Thank you. That they should seek God. Look at this. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Wow. You want to know what's beautiful? I'll tell you what's beautiful is that when you feel lost, God is not far from you. When you feel like, I don't know where, what I can, should do with my life, God is there in the moment. But it's us that don't come after God. God is there. God's seeking people. God is a seeker of men and women. We are built for God. So God is not far from us. We don't go just, where is God? God is here. It's us in our heart that are far from God. And many times we don't want God because we actually don't want God to tell us how to live our lives. So we actually, just, we want God to fix our problems, but we, we don't want God to fix our lives. Woo, whoa, wake up. Some of you guys are thinking about in and out. You totally missed that. We want God to fix our problems, but we don't want God to fix our lives. We don't, God to, we don't want anybody telling us how to live our life. I want to sleep with who I want to sleep with. I want to make whatever money I want to make. I want to move wherever I want to move. I want to do whatever I want to do. And God, I want you to fix all my issues, my anxiety, but I really don't want you telling me what to do. I want God as my fixer, but I don't want him as my Lord. I don't want him as my boss. I just want somebody to just come in and fix my problems and go away. Just fix my problems and get out of here. But guess what? God doesn't run around. He's not our errand boy. We owe God our lives because he, he builds us. He loves us. He has done everything for us. And it's us that keep God at arm's, arm's length. And I love those verses. It says, Lostness, when you feel lost, it should propel you to be found. In the lostness of, of Ikea, we were propelled to go find my son. My son didn't really care about his parents or whatever because he's sleeping on a bed. But what, after a while, once he wanted some Cheetos or whatever, when he started feeling hungry, he'd been like, dude, I need to get found because mom and dad need to feed me. Like lostness should propel you to be found. And that's what's happening here for this woman. Number one, Jesus leads for the lost. Number two, a woman seeks to be found. So she's going to find Jesus. Though she isn't a Jew, she recognizes Jesus' Jewishness by submissively calling him Lord. Look at this. Look at your Bible. In Matthew 15, verse 22, it says she came crying out, have mercy on me, O Lord. I told you to circle Lord. That's the word kurios. And it's basically the Greek word that means you're my boss. Imagine this woman uh, she's a stranger to Jesus. Jesus has never seen her in his whole life. She runs up and goes, Kurios, Kurios, Kurios. And what that means is you're the boss. You, 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 you run my life. You tell me what needs to be done and I will do it. That's what that means. It isn't like, Jesus, once you do stuff that I want you to do, then I'll think about following you. Once you fix my daughter, then you can be my Lord. Once you answer my prayer, then you can do, then I'll give you, then you'd be lucky to have me. God, you're lucky that I'm on your team. You're lucky I even put up with you, God. Now, we have, a, we have an arrogant heart that says, unless you do stuff, God, unless you jump through my hoops, you can't have me. And that's absolutely the wrong way to look at God. God, is, God deserves your best. God deserves your respect. God deserves your life because he gives you this life. And it's us that keep God away, not God wanting to be near us. And he, she comes up to Jesus and goes, Lord, which means boss, master, which is not just a title of respect, it's a title of submission. She has submission in her heart. As Jesus walks through the area, the woman continues to cry out about her daughter's situation, but Jesus is silent. The disciples beg Jesus to send her away as she continues to follow them from behind, irritating them. You ever been irritated? All my irritated people out there are irritated right now. You're like, it's kind of hot. I feel a little sticky. I wish we could meet indoors. Where's the air conditioning? Why didn't we build a bigger sanctuary four years ago so we could sit out, we could be inside somewhere in nice air conditioning? Like, why don't we buy different properties so that we could be, be all through? Like, if you're an irritable person, listen to me. Listen to me, ready? 
We live in a culture of irritation. We live in a culture that says it's almost like a, 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 a badge of honor. Whoever the most irritated is gets a, gets a sticker. We li- social media is built for irritation. Somebody says something you don't like, oh, did you hear about this? X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. I'm irritated about this. Oh, you see, you see this person did this bad thing or this person did the wrong thing or whatever. Listen, irritability is a product of pride. Irritability is a product of pride because what it's basically saying is things aren't the way I would do them or aren't the way I want them, so I'm going to let you know how irritated I am about it. Irritation is a product of pride. If you're an irritable person or you pass along memes that are irritable or you always facilitate irritation because you're like, I'm going to tell you how irritated I am or I'm going to tell you things that really irritate me today. It's actually pride in your life going, things aren't the way I want them to go and I'm going to tell other people about how irritated I am that things aren't my way. Listen, you need to start having an attitude of gratitude about even the things that are going not well in your life. Because why? God is always looking for people who are submissive to his will. Because watch, with submission comes blessing. We want to live our lives and have God bless us. We just want God to fix our problems and then bless us. Hey, can you bless me? But God says, follow me and I will bless you. And the the first step of following is submission. The first step of following is to say, you are my Lord. I'm not my Lord. God, you are my Lord. Jesus, you run my life. Once you do that, you enter the family of God and then God blesses you. But many of us want to run our lives but still want God to do what we want him to do. When you repent of your sin, come to know Christ and he changes your life, you are now you've become a child of God. And now God gives you a different mission in life. Rather than chasing the things you were chasing before, now you chase the things of God. And now God blesses you in your pursuit with him. Things won't always go the way you want them to go, but God will always guide you when you follow him. The disciples figure he's ignoring her because he's an important man and she's a forgettable female Gentile. However, Jesus isn't disregarding her anxiety, but is rather dissecting her authenticity. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't answer your prayer? You ever wonder why you prayed about that thing and God didn't answer it? Remember when, remember when you prayed and begged God that God wouldn't take your grandpa from cancer and he died and he was the only male, male role model you had in your whole life because dad vaporized and you're like, God, please don't take the one male in my life that's been solid. And he died and was taken away. Or your child, and you beg for your child's life in, in, in the hospital here. Or you beg, God, please don't let me lose this job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose everything. And that job vaporized. And many of us have lived our lives bitter at against, against God. Because like, God, you could have kept grandpa alive. You could have me, kept me that job. You could have kept my kid alive or helped him not to get sick. God, you can do all these things. Yet I pray about it and I believe it and nothing happens. Ready? I'm going to lay something out for you. There's a reason God doesn't answer prayer. Number one, sometimes it's ungodly and you don't even realize your prayers are ungodly. You're praying about, I want to marry this girl or I want to marry this guy and that guy's a total tool bag. You just don't know it yet. But Jesus does and he's protecting your foolish self from marrying that guy. And you're like, Jesus, if you really cared about me, you'd give me him. Jesus, if you really cared about me, you'd give me the hot chick that loves you. I don't know where she is, but somewhere. Guide me to her, Jesus. And Jesus didn't answer that prayer. And you, and you, and you, you have that loneliness in your life and you're like, man, God, what's going on? Let me help you. Sometimes God doesn't answer your prayer because it saves your bacon. I mean, praise God, he didn't answer all of my prayers from years ago that I didn't marry the one that I prayed about, that I didn't get that job I really wanted, that I didn't do that one thing that I really begged God for. Because I look back on it now and go, that would have been a total train wreck. And we fight against God and go, God, if you're really God, you'd answer this prayer. And he'd go, you don't even understand what you're asking. I'm already looking down the future and that'd be a total train wreck. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bless you with death. And the other side is this, ready? Sometimes God has a plan that you can't see. In fact, almost all the time. 
So when God takes grandpa or God takes a child or you, you get sick and you can't recover or whatever, God has wisdom in all things. Ready? Here's how you navigate when God doesn't answer your prayer, when God is silent, when you feel like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and you're like, this is valueless. Why am I even doing this? It's like, this, it's like the sky is made of glass and it just looks like it's clear, but my, my prayers just bounce right off it. Maybe there's no God. Maybe I'm praying to no one. Listen, the silence of God doesn't mean the absence of God. The silence of God many times means I either have something different for you or I have a will for your life and other people's lives that you don't see, but you have to trust me because this life isn't the last life. This life isn't your best life now. Your best life now is later. This life now is difficult and can be very hard, but God will walk with you through difficulty. And you're seeing that here with this woman. She's crying out to Jesus. Jesus says not a word. Watch this. You ever, you ever been irritated on vacation? Like, we're going to Maui. And you get to Maui and like, for whatever reason, you're just still irritated. And you got that person that like, you know, saw you from high school. And like, you meet them in Maui of all places. Jesus is like trying to get away from everybody. He's a rock star. He goes up to Tyre inside and he goes, I'm just gonna bring my bros. I'm gonna chill a little bit. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna hang out on the Mediterranean Sea. I'm gonna take my robe off and my, wear my little ch ch chonies, my Jesus chonies and get in, get in the Mediterranean Sea. You know, we're gonna throw rocks at each other or whatever Jesus is planning, you know, like a little, a little uh, you know, leadership retreat for his boys. He's like, nobody knows me up here. It's gonna be sweet. I'm, not, I'm getting mobbed in Israel. But Tyre and Sidon, I'm gold. He goes to Tyre and Sidon. All of a sudden, a woman's like, hey, I heard about, are you Jesus? Uh, nope, I just look like every other Jew. No, no, you're Jesus. You're like, oh man, no way. Are you serious? No, you're Jesus. And all of a sudden, they're trying to walk. And the woman's like, Jesus, please. Lord, please heal my daughter, heal my daughter. And I love that scripture records this. The disciples go to Jesus, go, Je Jesus, seriously, just a second. Can we just stop for a second? Please just turn around and tell her to go away. Listen, Peter already punched her in the face. You're gonna need to, she's still, this, this chick is relentless. Please just tell her to go away. I, literally, she's not gonna go away unless you turn around and go, woman, get out of here. I don't have time for you. I'm on vacation. Get out of here. Will you please just do that? Because he's silent. And, and, the, and the disciples go, oh, dude, Jesus is a rock star. She's like some nobody, nothing, nothing woman. Like, get out of here. He doesn't have time for you, obviously. But she's not listening to them. She's begging Jesus. Total silence, though. I love that the disciples are like, dude, Jesus, come on, man. Just tell her to go away. But Jesus has a plan. Ready? Here's the principle. The silence of God doesn't mean he isn't concerned with us, but it is often a test to see if we're connected to him. Wow. The silence of God doesn't mean he's not there, number one. And number two, it doesn't mean he doesn't care. No, but the, the, the thing that often comes out of God's silence in our lives is that he's testing to see if you're really connected to him. Do you really love God? Are you gonna still follow if your prayers don't get answered? That is often the test of prayers that are unanswered. Are you still gonna love God if he doesn't answer your prayer? If you're sick the whole rest of your life, you're still gonna love God? If you lose that great job you love, are you still gonna love God? If things fall apart, are you still gonna love God? Because for many of us, we go, I don't think so, honestly. Unless you start answering some prayers of mine and I get some stuff my way, I don't really think I'm gonna follow God. And those, those are one of the things that God does is he, in silence, he t puts you and me to the test. Number one, Jesus leaves for the lost. He's gonna find some lost people even on vacation. Number two, a woman seeks to be found. She hears about rock star Jesus. She's like, I wanna be close to Jesus because he's the only, I've taken my daughter to the temple of Eshman. That's a fail. But I, I know if I can make it to Jesus, I've heard about things he did in Israel. Like his reputation has preceded him. Leads us to lastly, number three, a woman is found by the savior. A woman is found by the savior. Finally, Jesus quips, that he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Hearing this, the woman sees an opportunity and runs to bow down at his feet. Ready? Look at this principle. Many times, the purest devotion comes from the deepest desperation. Listen to me. God is gonna put you to the test. Pay attention to what I'm saying if you're listening to me online. 
Ready? I'm almost done. So connect with me. Ready? God's going to put you to the test. We are in spiritual darkness in our country right now, and it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Okay? The church is not a luxury liner. The church is a battleship. If you're looking to come to church because it's easy and fun and everything goes the way you want it to, you're going to be sorely disappointed in the church that comes after all of this stuff is over. Your faith is going to cost you something, whereas in our culture, really up to this point, hasn't really cost us anything at all. So just, let's just be clear. Number one, ready? We're, going to, we're sailing into darker times spiritually in our, in our culture. Things are going to blow apart. But, the, but God is still God, and we trust him. He is our peace. He is our refuge. He is our strength. When all the chaos of our culture is happening, we always turn back to Jesus. We always focus back on Jesus because we know he can give us peace in our hearts when there's no peace anywhere else. Everybody still with me? Okay, so now this woman's like, you are my only way forward, Jesus. No, nothing else has worked. You need to help me. And I will beg you to help me change my life and my daughter's life. Desperation should drive us to God, not away from God. You can't imagine how many times I've heard people go, you know what, I, pray, I prayed about my, my son who was, getting, who was sick and, and God didn't heal him. And I, I decided in that moment, I'm not gonna follow God. If he can't heal my son, I'm out. And that's actually the opposite of what should happen. The opposite, if you have a submissive heart rather than a prideful heart saying, it better go my way or I'm out, like a pouty child. A submissive heart says, God, I love my child. I love my son. Please don't take him. You pray for healing. You pray for a miracle. And sometimes God does a miracle. Sometimes God does a miracle and brings your kid back to life and you just can rejoice in that moment. But the point is, whether, the, whether a miracle happens or a miracle doesn't happen, God is still God and he is worthy of our lives. So listen, this woman's like, I give you all I've got. You're a Jew, I'm a Gentile. You don't owe me anything. And I love this. Jesus is gonna play off a stereotype. He plays off a stereotype of 2,000 years ago. Think of a stereotype in our day and age. Like white, white man can't jump, right? So I got a Norwegian vertical, right? And the reason that's a stereotype in our culture is most basketball players and most football players in our, uh, and even a good chunk of baseball players are all, are all black. And so, you know, when you look at basketball teams or you look at, at uh, football teams, there's just a hand, there's just a sprinkling of white guys. And even some of the white guys in, in, uh, in uh, basketball, some of them are European. They're not even Americans. So you look at that and there's a stereotype in our culture like, well, you can't jump. So you can't play basketball. I had a friend who, uh, he was Asian and uh, we were talk he was talking about his mom driving. And he goes, he goes, uh, I just want to tell you something. You know the, you know the stereotype of, uh, of, of short Asian drivers? I, I, I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's true. It's really, it's stereotype because it's true. When I get in the car with my mom, I have to make sure I'm saved because I don't know if I'm going to make it home because she doesn't use turn signals. She's, she views the whole freeway as one lane and just kind of drives wherever. I, it's hard for me to even believe she can even see over the top of the dashboard. So even a, an Asian man was admitting the, the stereotype of of his mom who's an Asian driver. And Jesus is gonna use a stereotype. This is gonna blow your mind. This is gonna blow your mind when you, when you see the scripture. 2,000 years ago, there was a stereotype. You know what it was in their culture? Jews thought Gentiles, me, and probably you if you're not Jewish, were, do were on the level of dogs. Jews didn't eat with Gentiles. Like you wouldn't go out to, to lunch with them. You wouldn't sit down in the same restaurant. You wouldn't invite them to your house because why would you take a, a mangy dog off the street into your house? Like that's gross. They wouldn't even eat off the plates that if they knew Gentiles had used them previously, even if they would, had been cleaned because they thought they were permanently uh, damaged. Like permanently had COVID on them or whatever. And you know what Jesus does? He plays off this stereotype Watch this, they're walking. Disciples are following. They're saying, Jesus, get rid of this woman. He's silent. The woman finally goes, Jesus, will you help me? Jesus goes, I have not been sent to the Gentiles. I've been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she says, Jesus, please help me. And then, you know, Jesus pulls out a stereotype and he, that they both know, they both know it. The, the Gentile, the woman knows how the Jews view her and the Jews know how they view Gentiles. They know, this is a known stereotype. 
And Jesus goes, it's not right to throw the children's bread to the dogs. Now imagine if Jesus did that to you. Imagine how you'd blow Jesus up on, on, on social media. Hang on, hang on. Did you just call me a dog? Oh no, you didn't. Are you serious? Oh man, oh hashtag Jesus is a hater. Jesus calls this woman a dog because it was the stereotype of their day to go, why would the Jewish Messiah, I'm the most famous Jewish person literally that's ever hit the face of the globe. Why in the world should I care about you? You nameless, faceless Gentile woman that just wants my help. Literally, I'm the most important person on the face of the globe as we speak. It's not right that the Jewish Messiah, the bread of the Jews should be given to the dogs. Like the Jews were known as the children of God. I am their Messiah as a Jew. I am their, literally their bread. Why would it be given to, why would the attention of the Messiah be given to a dog? Can you believe that? Imagine if that was you. You know what you do, you and I would do in this culture? We view being offended as like a virtue. Like I'm so offended. Can you believe how offended I am right now? I'm super offended. Hashtag really offended. And our culture goes, wow, your life is hard. You're so offended. That's like amazing. You're an amazingly offended person. <laughs> but you know what she does? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a secret of living and then I'm done. Listen to me. I'm gonna give you a secret of living. Humility wins the day. Offense is a picture of pride in your heart. If you get offended easy, that means you're a prideful person because you're always, it always has to be your way or things aren't the way you would have them be, which is, a, which is an element of pride. If you're an easily offended person, you have a massive pride problem. And our culture supports that. Going, if you're offended, that's like a virtue in our culture. Hey, share your offense. <laughs> but you know what she does? She doesn't go, did you just call me a dog? Okay, I'm out of here. Everything I heard about you is wrong. I heard you were awesome, you're a loser. You know what she does? I, in heaven, I'm gonna high five this lady. I'm gonna say, you know what? I preached on you in 100 degree heat in Temecula. And you know why I gave you a high five in Temecula? Because she uses razor sharp wit and intellect. You know what I love when I, when I hear people with, with good intellect and sharp wit? I just go, man, that's awesome. Because she brings it up out of nowhere. She could have been offended. And she goes, yeah, but even the bread that falls off the table, the dogs get to eat. Wow. Like that's humility and wit and intelligence all wrapped up in one. She goes, yeah, I could be a dog. You're right. You, the Jews view me as a dog. But guess what? Even the dog, it's a, cr a few crumbs that could fall off the master's table. Wow. I mean, you want to talk about a woman that's like, I'm in total submission to you. You can offend me and I still love you. Look at this and I'm done. As it was a known stereotype that the Jews considered Gentiles equal to dogs, Jesus plays off that stereotype. He uses the imagery of the children of the house, the Jews, getting their bread, the attention of their Messiah, Jesus, diverted to the puppy or the family pet, which is the Gentiles. Instead of being offended with humility and wit, she notes that even a family pet gets a little of what the children get. How many of you guys have dogs in your house? Dog people, put your hands up. Everybody, who's got a cat? That's sad. That's really sad. We have, do we have a dog at home. And you know what, Samson? Samson usually gets the grossest food that can possibly be made. I get the 50 pound bag from Costco. It's basically, his dog food's like compressed sawdust or whatever. It's like the quality is just horrible. But you know, he loves it. He just thinks like it's steak dinner every, every meal he gets. Well, guess what? When he comes in the house and we're, we're eating as a family around the table, you know what he does? He'll sit right there and I'll see drool starting to come down because he knows his sawdust food that I usually feed him is nothing compared to people food. And so I'll give him like a piece of pizza, you know, like I'm like, oh, Samson, would you like this? And you know what? Just because I love him, I will bless him with a piece of pizza that was designed for me, but given to him. 
And you know what? He is ecstatic. He's like, I usually get dog food, but today I get people food. And it's like the, the best day of his life when he gets to eat from the food that humans give him. She plays off this stereotype. She goes, you're right. Even if I am a dog, sometimes the dog gets food that the, that the children get to eat too. And I love that. I, wanna, I, want you to, I want you to absorb this moment in her life. She could have chosen offense, which our culture would. Our culture would be offended and walk away. But instead, in humility, she says, regardless of what happens, you're still my Lord. And in this moment now, Jesus heals her daughter. Her prayers are answered because humility, not pride, not offense, humility paves the way for God's blessing. God blesses humility. God rejects pride. And, and, and offense rides on top of pride. If all you do is share uh, things that you're offended by or whatever it is, that's a picture of your heart. Ready? The last principle is this. Humility can make a way for miracles. Humility makes a way for miracles. Humility makes a way for miracles. How can you and I be more humble? Submit to God's will. Right now, pray God, I got a lot. Here's my anxieties I got, God. There's an emergency happening right now. You know what the emergency is? Your heart. The emergency is you and I need humility in our life. And humi- the first step of humility is submission to Christ. Jesus, I'm totally lonely, but I'm not going to sleep around. Jesus, I don't know what, I lost my job. I don't know what's going to happen financially, but I want to be faithful to you. I'm not going to bury myself in credit. I'm not going not to do things that are illegal to make, to make a dime. I want to I honor you because I believe you honor me. God, I have these anxiety, I have these anxious feelings. I feel like I might want to die. I might want to kill myself. I don't know if I want to live another day. Understand this, that when you humble yourself before God, you can give your anxiety to Jesus because Jesus has the future and you can trust God with your future. And so even in the moment, you can feel anxious, but you give it to Christ and go, God, these are the emotions I feel, but I want to be at peace. And the God of all peace will minister to you peace. And that's peace that doesn't come from the world. That's peace that doesn't come from social media. That's peace that only comes from Jesus. Your first step towards Christ is one of humility and God will bless you because God blesses humility because God loves you and God wants the best for your life. 